Auto Line After Hours is brought to you by Bridgestone Tires, your journey, our passion, and by Lear, a global leader in automotive seating and electrical systems. This is AutoLine After Hours with John McElroy and Gary Vassalash, episode 354 for November 4th of 2016. LOL, Lutz Out Loud. Watch AutoLine After Hours live at AutoLine.tv every Thursday at 3 p.m. Eastern Time. That's 12 p.m. Pacific. You can subscribe to this podcast for free by searching for AutoLine in iTunes, Stitcher, or YouTube. Okay, welcome everybody to AutoLine After Hours, especially my co-host, Gary Vassalash. Hey, Gotta welcome you. Boy, two weeks in a row we've been doing the show together. You know, we're on a tear. We are. <laughs> Although you've been traveling and you've got a pre-recorded show coming up right. uh, and all about December Alfa Romeo, Romeo Julia. Romeo, yeah, yeah. yeah I, good show. I, I can't wait to see it myself. Well, neither can I. And we got to let everybody know that we got Frank Marcus from Motor Trend back in the studio with us. Say a few syllables, Frank, so they know that a you're really here. A few syllables. Yeah, yeah. I'm really here. Yes, indeed. I am dying to try an Alfa Romeo Julia as well. It seems like that's been delayed about a billion times, but it drives and it okay. It goes quickly. Okay. But now we got to let everybody know. Of course, our special guest today is Bob Lutz. I think what your current title is CEO of Lutz Communications, right. Chairman of VLF. Automotive. That's correct, yeah. And a whole bunch of prior titles before that that everybody watching now knows about anyway. <laughs> and you brought a car. I did. I did. I, I brought uh, a VLF Destino. Okay. Now, for those who don't know what a VLF Destino is, let, let's get the thumbnail. Well, I, I, I'll, I'll, I'll bet that a, a large part of your listeners do know, but... VLF Destino is a, a project that was um, started by my partner, Gilbert Villarreal, who is the V in, in VLF. And uh, what we did is we took Fisker Karmas, de-electrified them by removing the battery, uh, installing a Corvette ZR1 drivetrain, made it to a heavy-duty GM six-speed automatic transaxle at the rear end. Then we did a, a new front end. Uh, because we wanted to change the identity from Fisker, and I, neither of us ever liked that handlebar mustache that the Fisker Karmas had. Uh, we did a new rear end because we had to incorporate the four exhausts from the ZR1. We did a new deck lid because of, with our top speed of uh, around 200 miles an hour, we needed more of a, a, a lip on the spoiler. And we did a new hood because we needed clearance for the supercharger. And... Um, and, of course, we took out the solar panel roof that um, Fisker used, which didn't do anything. I mean, it, it wouldn't even generate enough electricity to make a tiny little light bulb glow faintly. But it was, it was there for enviro-psychological reasons. Just like, wow, it even has a solar roof. Smuggler. Does it, does it do anything? Uh, not sure, but it's there. Anyway, it uh, shows the company's commitment to the environment and that sort of thing. And, that's all, and we replaced that with a carbon fiber roof. So hood, deck lid, um, or carbon fiber. Uh, hood, deck lid, and roof are carbon fiber. Front and rear fascias are more conventional automotive um, uh, composites. And um, the rest of the car, the doors, doors and glass, and everything is as was on the Fisker Karma. All in all, uh, we have 640 horsepower put through a, a six-speed automatic with paddle shifters, if you want, with rev matching on the downshifts. So it's very nice. Outstanding road manners, uh, and the car is 1,100 pounds lighter than, than a Fisker Karma was. So we're at 3,900 pounds. They were at 5,100, so it's about 1,200 pounds lighter. So in terms of the design changes, did the F in VLF... That's Help Henrik that? Fisker. Right. Well, what happened is he he brought some new projects to the company. Uh, like he he had an order from um, a large Dodge Viper dealer for 50 of the Force Ones, which are Viper based but with an all new body. And uh, Henrik said, "Listen, if you make me a partner in the firm, um, you, you guys are the logical people to have this project." And uh, so we said, fine. I mean, it's nice having F Henrik Fisker on board anyway, because B 
before that, I was doing the design. And oh. you know that that is barely adequate as opposed to world class. Um, I don't know, you got an eye for those well, sorts of I, things. I have an eye, but there's a difference between being an excellent music critic and actually playing the oboe yourself, you know. <laughs> You can, you, can, you can see what's wrong with somebody else's performance, but then being able to do it yourself is an entirely different matter. At any rate, we're glad to have Henrik. And since then, we're, we're working on, VLF is working on numerous other projects because it's obvious that uh, I think in today's fashion world, uh, sedans are an endangered species, so we're going to have to do something more on the line of a high-end crossover or uh, SUV. Uh, and that's all in the works. And, and Henrik Fisker is a one-man army when it comes to design. Really? Hey, we got a question here from one of our viewers, Armand, who said, Henrik Fisker just showed off a new car. I, I don't think it's the, the one that you're talking about with the Viper in it. No, uh, Henrik, the Rivero? Henrik, Henrik had uh, a prior arrangement with, uh, I'm pretty sure it's Chinese money, Chinese-based, uh, for an all-electric vehicle to potentially take on Tesla. I'm, I'm not sure if that's worth the trip, but... Uh, and uh, they're also working with an all-new battery technology. And uh, that's, that's separate from VLF. And at this point, I think the only thing that exists in the car is a design rendering or multiple design renderings and idea sketches. But at this point, I, I don't think it's funded. I don't think they have a battery. I don't, they certainly don't have a car. And all that may well come, but it'll have, it'll have nothing to do with his VLF venture. That's why we, you know, it, VLF, it's like, remember Rio trucks in the, where it's Rio stood for ransom e olds. That's right. Yeah, and uh, so the fact that Henrik's name is is an initial here you know, shouldn't trouble him with his other enterprises. So where do the Destinos come from? You mean the name? No, I mean the production. Where production. are you building? Them oh, these days? Uh, and not far from here in Auburn Hills. In fact, you go up to six ninety six Hawker Wright, then go up Telegraph, uh, Square Lake, and then. Up, uh, up, seventy-five and other past the Chrysler headquarters. That's where our plant is. Hmm. But with all the projects we've got going, some of which are going to be much higher volume than the Destino, uh, we're going to we're we're urgently in need of another plant. Wow. Interesting. So, uh, to get this car here that we've got in the studio, it, it's uh, an owner of a Fisker brings it to you, and that's you do one. That's version? one avenue, and. Uh, I think it's a very sensible avenue for for fi owners of Fisker Karma. There's about 2,000 of them out there in this great land of ours, many of whom are not n not in an operational condition, and they're all high-end customers with um, you know very very substantial means. The, I would say they were the first generation of Tesla owners before Tesla came on the scene. In other words, they wanted a beautiful car, but it had to be ecologically sound. Uh, and these people are sitting on a car that's that's uh, like a boat anchor now, and for roughly the price of a new car, if their car is in good condition and they're all low mileage, so you know they will be, uh, we can transform it into a Destino for half the price of a new car. Hmm. So w wasn't the Karma sort of using the Volt architecture and in, in? Well, it wasn't the Volt architecture; it was the Volt principle okay. of. Uh, a, a battery that provided about 50 miles of electrical range, and then the piston engine would cut in, never drive the car, but would drive a generator that kept the battery at about a 20% in the so-called charge sustain mode. The whole, of course, the Volt was much lighter than this thing. And to be honest, the Volt was far, far, far better engineered than the Karma was. The Karma was, you know, engineered by a group of limited size and limited experience, whereas General Motors poured its vast electric and electronic resources on the car. And the, the first generation Volt, which I loved and I loved to drive it, was slick as a whistle. And 
the transitions from electric to to um, uh, charge sustain mode. If you didn't look at the symbol on the instrument panel flick or the cluster flick, you couldn't tell. Whereas on the Karmas, you could really you could really <laughs> tell. And all the owner said when when you were on charge sustain because it was such a heavy car, that engine revved and made a, a buzzing noise that was highly audible. So it was just for what something that was, I think, around $125,000, it was not a satisfactory experience. But with the, with the 6.2 liter V8, six speed automatic, and uh, the 1,100 pounds out, it is for all the world like a four-door ZR1, except that the ride is more balanced and more compliant. Do you have any uh, performance numbers you want to share with us? Well, we, we're uh, zero to 60. We're maybe a tenth of a second off of a ZR1, so we're around 3.3. Three. And top speed, which we haven't tested, but since the ZR1 is over 200, we have roughly the same frontal area, and for top speed, weight doesn't matter. So we're, we're saying around 200. So you never got any uh, actual wind tunnel time or anything like that. Did anyone do computational fluid dynamics or whatever to tune that lip in the back? I, I'm not quite sure what we did, but we were, with all the engineers were, of, of which we had about six, were of the opinion that with the higher top speed, we needed a little more spoiler. <laughs> Fair enough. Mm-hmm. And if you look at it, the profile is not dissimilar from a Corvette, and the drag coefficient, despite the fact that when you when you put it next to, like, my wife's new Z06, you can see, wow, this thing's about three inches higher, but you don't pick it up visually because it's so wide, and it's also several inches longer than a Corvette. So since length uh, helps your drag coefficient, even though the frontal area is somewhat greater, but... I'm, I'm, I'm guessing that the drag coefficient is below a Corvette. So mm. or I would the, think so, too, f- yeah. for the length reason. Yeah. I'm surprised that the, you didn't have a packaging problem putting a Corvette engine into... Well, you know what? I don't, I, don't, I don't know what our technological pay capabilities are here today, but it would be easy to walk over there, pop the hood, and have a maybe a handheld focus on the installation. But we, we obviously checked that out first. We started by... Uh, we had the good luck. Well, here we got a, a shot that uh, the oh, yeah, crew took okay. earlier of the hood open. Yeah, and it, it doesn't exactly show the... Uh, yeah, there you can see we have good clearance toward <laughs> the back. We have good lateral clearance. We have good clearance toward the front. Nice, clean, and, underhood appearance. Yeah, too. and the V8, the, that 6.2-liter V8, is really not much longer than the Ecotec 4, <laughs> which was because four cylinders in length, you know. Yeah. The, uh, <laughs> And, and, and small block and, is one of the p- most power dense. Yeah, and and that's one of the beauties of the small block. But, and then of course, not being overhead cam, it doesn't have the camshaft drive off the front, which the Ecotec did. So this engine may even—I never measured it—but it may be shorter than an Ecotec. Hmm. At any rate, it fit, and it's not that much heavier than an Ecotec. Uh, we had very little trouble with rebalancing it with the. Six-speed auto in the back. We've got a 50-50 weight distribution. The car is beautifully weighted. And my biggest surprise is, was because of our limited staff and the limited amount of testing we were able to do and, and by basically over-engineering everything to make sure we didn't have to test to the breaking point. My big surprise is the incredible, uh, totally mature level of refinement in the car. It's NVH, ride, handling, the weighting of the steering, the brake balance and everything. It's as if a huge, world-class, gigantic producer like Mercedes or or BMW had done the car. I, when I drive it, I ask myself, I really don't see how any large corporation could have done any better. Hmm. Now that was, you know, partly because we were dealing with a well-engineered um, chassis, and and it's all. If you look at the chassis, it's not stamped or anything. It's all extruded aluminum sections welded together. Well, that of course is very stiff, mm-hmm. and it deadens sound. Uh, and the body on the body on uh, 
the karma or the destino is mostly cosmetic. It has no structural function. What ever attracted you to this in the first place? I mean, oh yeah, well, when, 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 when VL, VL Gilbert and I uh, rented a building in Auburn Hills, which was shared with ADOC, the German engineering firm, and ADOC had done most of the work on the karma. And my partner Gilbert was always taken with the karma, and he said, "God, I always wanted one of those things, but uh, it, it had the wrong engine." Why don't, we, why don't we put a V8 in it? And I said, Gilbert, that's not that easy. Uh, and I went on to explain just how difficult it was to take a four-cylinder hybrid and make a V8 supercar out of it. And Gilbert says, okay, yeah, I believe you. He, you know, he's, not, he's not that knowledgeable about cars. Likes cars, but you know, he's the average consumer rather than the originator. And, and uh, so one day he says, I was looking and poking around in the back of the ADOG building and I found three old Karma pre-production prototypes. They're not very pretty and they're half rusted, but you know what? I'm, I'm gonna buy a few ZR1 drivetrains and I'm just gonna cut one up and see what happens. And I said, Gilbert, I wish you luck, but I wouldn't do that. He said, well, I, I, I get all three of them for $30,000, how much money can I lose? I said, well, okay. And so away he went, and he, they cobbled the first one together, and I looked at it, and I said, well, it obviously all fits. And then we did a drivable one, and it, that first one wasn't very good, but it was proof of concept. And then we did the first two show cars that were, again, mechanically not perfect, but for the auto show, they were fine. And now we've really got a car that we can be very proud of. Obviously, we had to increase the size of the fuel tank from about, I think, 10 gallons. We were able to get it up to 19 gallons by going around various, because it's a f metal fabricated tank that goes around a lot of yeah, corners. That's hard to do in metal. It's easier if it's well, blow molded. Well, we don't, we, don't need the we tool, didn't, right? we yeah, didn't yeah, yeah. have the money for tooling. And we, you know, we, we hire a lot of craftsmen, which luckily in the Auburn Hills area are easy to get. But, um, uh, Gilbert is uh, one of the most effective lean manufacturing people I've ever known, and he will not automate anything if he can get it done reliably by hand, uh, even if you know that ultimately with automation it would be cheaper. But he says, yeah, but that's only, that's only if you have enough volume to justify the tooling. Uh, so uh, uh, Gilbert has the same philosophy that I always wanted to see at General Motors is let's try it in a low volume way and if it's successful we can always invest afterwards but it was always the big companies always look at the volume estimates and they say yeah we're going to need to tool this one properly and then they went, then they spend 700 million up front and then the project's a flop uh, so that happens again and again. You'll never catch Gilbert doing it. Gilbert's philosophy is, I want to make money on the first car. Well, you know, that's not quite going to happen. But um, when you buy, I will honestly say, this program, if, if it had been taken on by Audi or GM or Ford, to take a Fisker Karma, take all the stuff out of it, replace it with a modern V8 drivetrain, um, maintain all the airbag integrity, continue to pass front crash, side crash, rear crash, rollover, uh, airbag deployment, the whole nine yards, plus comply with all emission regulations. Any re real automobile company would have spent between 200 and $250 million on the project. <laughs> Why? Well, because you just so many people touching it and so many outside suppliers, and we, we had outside suppliers for stuff like rebalancing uh, the, the uh, stability control system, uh, which of course with the weight and the power sheds, it's all new. And they said, well, that'll be $750,000, please. This says, well, you, you know, you just destroyed our business plan for the next three years. Um, and and, and we're, we're not General Motors, so Oh, okay. Well, uh, we think we can do it for seventy-five thousand. Oh, thank you. That's much better. <laughs> yeah. Then <laughs> number of zeros. Yeah. Then Gilbert says, 
Uh, how, if you don't mind me asking, how much time are you going to spend on this? Mm, uh, about three weeks. And how many people are you going to put on it? Uh, we'll have about 10 of our engineers on it. So as the Gilbert says, and what does an engineer cost per hour? And then they realize they've just been sandbagged because mm. all Gilbert needed was the hourly rate times the number of engineering hours, and he came up with the cost. And he says, look, uh, I don't mind paying double what it costs, but 75000 is ridiculous. And they said, well, OK, we'll, we'll do it for 12000 you know? <laughs> and, and what happens with the, the big companies, w w Gilbert and I can tool front and rear fascias for about, the, the tool for that front fascia was probably $30,000. Wow. The, the rule of thumb. That's nothing. Or, yeah, the rule of thumb in the big automobile companies for new front and rear fascias is 800000 to a million each. Uh, you know, to, we, because you, you learn all these rules of thumbs, you know, door outers are 5 million, hood or, hoods are 2 million, and you, you sort of learn to evaluate total investments. Then when you get out of the big companies and you start working on your own car and you deal with, first of all, in many cases, you deal with different people. But, and you're dealing with your own money. Uh, yeah, but... That changes it, it, your focus. Uh, yes, it does, because you just can't afford the big solution. But it is absolutely remarkable for how little money uh, you can actually and get. As long as you don't try to do an all-new car from scratch, then it becomes very difficult and very expensive. Or you want to do an all-new powertrain, because... You know, my car is going to be so noble, I'm going to have my own engine. I mean, that nowadays is, is a hopeless proposition. Uh, but as long as you... Our, our only challenge was taking a well-known, well-engineered chassis and body and a well-engineered, reliable, well-known, high-performance drivetrain and marrying the two. And it wasn't trivial. Dimensionally, it wasn't difficult. But getting the GM modules to talk to the Fisker modules and getting the instrument cluster to display the right things and getting all of the battery state of charge information off of the electronic cluster and all that. And then um, meeting OBD2 regulations and getting the right lights to light up and not light up when they shouldn't. That um, even as it does for the big car companies, it's always OBD2 compliance is always a, a long process that requires a lot of trial and error, which is why everybody has captured test fleets of production cars so that you catch all the check engine lights before they get out to the public. But that, that was very time consuming. And then we lost time when, um, when Fisker went bankrupt because that interrupted our, our source of parts. And... Uh, computer data that we needed for crash simulation, because we did we d we did have to demonstrate that the car meets all relevant crash regulations, and it it passes everything with a very good margin because structurally, um, it's it's a very a very stiff car, uh, but made out of aluminum and. And composite, so it has good crush characteristics. Were you able to? And, and we're doing 1,200 pounds less. Yeah. Minute, so. Okay. Hold, hold, hold your thought. Remember your question. We got to take a quick break right now. We got to pay some bills here. We got to give a shout out to our good friends from Bridgestone. Okay, we're back. And I rudely cut you off, Frank, but shoot. Uh, on the uh, crash testing simulation, were you able to buy the CAD data for the whole drivetrain from GM? That's exactly what we didn't get. Uh oh because of their bankruptcy and, you know, under bankruptcy, they can't sell assets. And even though we had had um, a written agreement with them that they would supply what we call the mesh model, uh, in the end, we had to duplicate it, which was time consuming and, and expensive. But right now, it, our, our total investment is, let's say, right around $10 million in the, to get us from a Fisker Karma to a VLF Destino. And, and if you made, so 2,000 would be the number you could conceivably make if you made every single if, car model? Th those are just uh, the existing people. We also have, uh, there's still a supply of new cars, 
um, unsold Fiskars that are in dealer lots, uh, which we can access. We personally own 23, which is part of what the initial cash outlay was to make sure we had a decent supply of cars to get us going. And then um, at some point, if we run out of Fisker components and the Karma Corporation is, the new Karma Corporation is unwilling to sell us bodies, um, it will not cost very much to duplicate all the body tooling. Oh, you can't get it back from Valmet or whoever it was? It probably, probably, well, we, you know, we haven't even investigated it, that because it's, it's not something we have to check on right now. But uh, if we had to, we can retool the whole car. And then interior comes from suppliers, ventilation, heating, HVAC is suppliers, steering, brakes, and all the mechanical components are suppliers. So other than the chassis, which, which we can duplicate, it's in, as I say, extruded aluminum sections w w welded together, other than the chassis and the body, everything comes from suppliers, as is usual in the automobile business. So if we had to duplicate the chassis and fabricate it at low volumes, and, and, and when, we, when, we, when it comes time to redo the body, that is probably the time when we would ask Henrik to update the body. And we would, we'd probably try to keep all of the major interior dimensions so that we don't have to recertify airbags but we could easily do, you know, new front end, new rear end, new door outers, and uh, do a somewhat more contemporary front front fascia on the car with a, a, an upgraded, maybe a, a more vertical type grill, um, less of a horizontal theme, which was which we've got now. Uh, so I, I am not worried about the future supply of components. As I, I tell Gilbert, let's worry about that when we're all sold out of conversions in our own 23 cars. I also wonder, you know, because I'm sure some people wonder, what ever happened to all the Hurricane Sandy uh, Fiskars? They were underwater. And uh, I, I'm not, in, and the, the, the insurance never paid Fisker for those. So they were, I think that's one of the reasons for the bankruptcy. They, they, they lost those, what were they, 80 cars? Kind of a lot of them, yeah. 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 I'm not sure where those are, but they, they would be fine for us. I yeah. mean, they're they're cooked as far as Fisker being Fisker karmas are concerned. But you haven't the, looked into uh, getting batteries, a hold of them? batteries and electric. But right now, I'll tell you what we don't we don't need more Fiskers. <laughs> <laughs> we need we need to sell the ones we've got. You, you mentioned the Karma Corporation, and so they just showed the Rivero. Now, is that a Karma that's N no, the, the Fisker Rivero is something entirely new and different, a new company, and uh, the Karma Corporation is no longer called Fisker. It's all very confusing, and uh, the Karma people are frankly a little bit, the Chinese company, Wang Chung, are frankly a little bit annoyed with Henrik for having joined us, and especially for having started another, or being engaged with another electric startup, and um, they they know that there's probably going to be, or they suspect there's going to be some confusion. Not so much with us, because Henrik is only an initial in our car, but in the new one, I mean, that's the Fisker Rivero, and uh, we'll see what happens. But again, I... Uh, You've seen all these Chinese electric startups like Faraday, and it's just every year there's a new design rendering. And you say, could we see a car here sometime, please? Well, that's coming, but and I, I think Henrik will probably push to get something faster than that. But I've, I've warned Henrik, and I said, look, if you were doing this with lithium-ion batteries, I would say you've got a good shot. Of, uh, you work with um, uh, A one three three. No, LG Chem. Uh, LG. LG. Work, work with LG Chem. Uh, get, have them give you a battery pack. Fabricate a car. You know you can be on the market in eighteen to twenty four months. 
<clears throat> but they're going after an all new battery chemistry, which is going to give you, I don't know, a thousand miles per charge, which is, you know, it's wonderful, but it's way out there. And having been in the battery business myself, there are 50 to 100 people out there who have the miracle battery. They're just looking for a sponsor. And they're all going to do stuff that no other battery has ever done before. And when you investigate, you know, there's always something terribly wrong. I, I, I just was propositioned in the business sense <laughs> by a company that wants me to take this to the automotive world. And it is a, a nanomaterial, get this, a nanomaterial that through molecular movement generates its own electricity. And it just sits there, you know, this piece of metal or plastic, and it'll... Electrons just come out. It, electrons just come pouring out because they're spontaneously generated inside this thing by molecules moving around. And this is the end of our energy worries, uh, you know, when this is universally adopted. Cold fusion. And, and you, Mr. Lutz, are the ideal person to take this to the world. And I said, well, I always had a problem with perpetual motion and f energy free lunches. You know, I can't tell you how many proposals we got when we first showed the vault where people were saying, what you need to do is put two little wind driven turbines on the roof. <laughs> and that the, as you're driving down the freeway at 70 miles an hour, the turbines will be motored and they'll drive a generator, it'll go into the battery, and it'll produce its, it'll produce its own electricity thanks to the speed. And I said, yeah, I mean, perpetual motion has been around forever. Nobody's ever quite figured out how to make it work. And then we try to, and then we had other proposals where put gener the rear wheels are not driven, right? They're along for the ride. I said, yeah, put generators in them. There's the answer. And then you'll be generating electricity as the front wheels are, are driven electrically, and it'll produce its own electricity ad infinitum. So I, I've, I've grown inured to these schemes, and especially in the energy field, there is so much. You probably remember a few years ago, the popular thing was instant hydrogen. This was where uh, you'd put water in your gas tank, and then it would pass through a, a a, catal a catalyst with magic crystals inside and uh, 12 <laughs> volts. And then it would separate into two tubes and one tube would contain oxygen and the other tube would contain hydrogen, which then would be fed into your engine. And so all you need is a 12 volt battery, that little miracle converter and a tank full of water and you can be driving along on free hydrogen and get Thousands of trouble-free miles. Were they going to condense it and keep the water perpetually as well? I tell you, version 2.0. Uh, intelligent people put a huge amount of money, huge amounts of money into those schemes. <laughs> That's amazing. Anyway, hey, we digress. Well, we're going to digress all show long. That's plenty good. Uh, we got an, another. Uh, question here from a, a viewer. A big hello from Switzerland, Martin Sinzig, oh, the yeah, Swiss the Chevy, Chevy guy. Man. Yeah, the Swiss Chevy guy. Yeah. He wants an update on Via Motors. He says, how many trucks have been sold and, and what's ever gone on with that? Uh, what's what's going on with it is... This uh, was the hybrid truck. Yeah, e it's, it's like a Volt. It's 40 to 50 miles electric, then the gas engine cuts in. I'm still chairman of the company and we're still in operation, but... Uh, struggling with the declining cash availability. And, and, and probably $2 gasoline isn't well, helping. That, that kind of, you know, destroyed a lot of the business case for utilities. We're still working with large customers like uh, a lot of huge Mexican fleets that do urban delivery, which would probably be electric most of the time. Um, and we're talking to the military because of the stealth properties of the first 50 miles electric. And we have delivered uh, electric Chevrolet vans to, uh, I think, one of the phone companies. I'm not sure if it's Verizon, but, but also to FedEx. Uh, so 
there's about, I think last count, a couple of hundred vans out there and an ongoing, and the trouble with the pickup is by the time we got the pickup finished and fully certified, General Motors went to the next generation. And that would have been okay. We would have, you know, done an all-time buy of the old ones or something. But the V6 engine changed. And that means um, all new emission certification, uh, et cetera. I mean, it's basically start over. And the new GM pickup, we, we didn't want the crew cab. We wanted the extended, no, I'm sorry, we did want the crew cab but with the V6 engine. And that combination has been canceled by General Motors. That's exactly the one we were working on because we were gonna have 400 horsepower thanks to the electric motor. However, there are, you know, it looks like there's new investors coming in. Um, meanwhile, the company is unfortunately having to restrict its cash outlays until the funding becomes available. But the technology is good, the reliability is there. We've got an excellent CEO and a, a wonderful president, um, highly capable people. Bob Purcell, I don't know if you ever knew him. Oh yeah, absolutely. Bob Purcell is the president, one of the best engineers and smartest guys I've ever met. So we've got a great executive team. What we, what we have is business difficulties yeah. right now. But we, you know, we'll survive. Hey, we've got a, a lot of other questions and other topics we want to get into. We're going to take a real quick break right here and come back. And coming out of that, we got to hear from Dr. Data as well. So, Carmen, let's take that quick break. From Shanghai to the Silicon Valley, the auto industry may make news around the globe, but there's only one spot to get your daily dose. Check out AutoLine Daily at AutoLine.tv, Monday through Friday at noon Eastern. Okay, we're back, and time for Dr. Data to step forward. Gary? Okay, so uh, found an interesting number for the week, and uh, so, Carmen, please bring it up. Actually, a series of numbers. So, London 101, Stuttgart 73, Antwerp 71, Cologne 71, and Brussels 70. What are we looking at here? Hmm. I'm going to guess, oh, and there's, like, traffic in the background. Well, it sure as hell isn't temperatures. No, it isn't. It's not temperatures. And Too low for hours stuck in traffic? Uh, Frank just guessed it? Our, the average time lost in traffic per year in hours. Okay, so, so if you look at that number, 101 for London. Now, earlier, when we were before the show started, and Bob, you were mentioning about that London has this congestion charge. Yeah. And it's, it's sort of interesting that you would imagine that the number for London would actually be decreased yeah. rather than being, you know, enormously high compared to second, which is Stuttgart. Yeah. So then I checked the numbers in the United States for hours lost. And surprisingly enough, L.A. is the top, but it's only at 81 hours lost per year. Are, are we sure that every, everybody is measuring the same around the world? Yeah, it was, it was all, all from the same database. Okay. So, so basically what it begins to wonder is, is that why would these these people who tried to do this this social engineering in terms of driving end up actually what was increasing. it before the congestion job yeah, yeah. 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 That's, a good, that's a good question but i mean but you know all, now obviously london is is a, is a rather large place with uh, and, you know, and, eight, and eight with people with an um, you know portions of london are poorly designed because they were never designed it just grew or were cow paths from the medieval yeah, ages exactly and and um, a lot of places are just natural traffic bottlenecks, whereas you could argue that L.A. being a relatively recent city with big boulevards and everything, I mean, you just don't have any big boulevards in London. Mm -hmm. well, so, it's, so, so that, was, that was our number for the week. All right. It's interesting. But it, it, it also makes the case for autonomous vehicles because those numbers are just going to drop way down. Oh, no, because... Um, with autonomous vehicles, <laughs> with minimum nose-to-tail spacing electronically, and every car transponder equipped so that if you're number 15 in the line for a green light or whatever equivalent there will be then, when 
the signal goes green instead of the first car moving and after two seconds the guy in the second car puts down his phone and says oh my god <laughs> and 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 you know you're if you're number five you're not going to get through the light whereas with autonomous vehicles that whole stick of 10 or 15 cars is going to move at the same time with no change in nose to tail distance so that the traffic throughput is going to be double or triple what it is with non-autonomous vehicles. It's all going to flow. But the hours lost in traffic will be zero. Because yeah, or, or, they won't be lost. You'll, yeah, be doing, you'll be doing things in the car. Uh, yeah, or infinite, depending on how you look at it. If, you, you know, if, you, if, you, if your work requires your physical presence, you could say that. So, yeah. so you've got this magnificent car here with, with 200 mile an hour top end speed. And you're talking autonomous cars? I mean, well, I, 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 it depends whether we're talking the immediate future or the longer range future. In the immediate future, cars like this can still be enjoyed for probably another two decades. Uh, after that, they'll have to be on private private road parks like uh, M1 Concourse. Yeah, M1 Concourse or Monticello, New York, or Autobahn and Joliet, Illinois, or the and there's a bunch of them in, uh, in California, too. And, and that's the kind of automobile producer that will survive the age of autonomous vehicles. Where the, the, it's like the horse business today, you know, where people look for an expensive jumping horse. They're willing to pay $200,000, $250,000 for a horse that has the potential of, of letting them win. And it'll be much the same in the car business, and those will be very interesting cars, and they won't have to satisfy any government regulations. So I'm hoping that the ultimate fate of my destino here will be to be comfortably going around the track at some motorsports park 30 years from now. So what will other cars be? What will the autonomous car be like? They'll be, they'll be standardized with very little room for the designer's intervention. Because not, not stage one and stage two, they'll continue to look much as today, but stage four autonomy, autonomous, where there are no longer any controls, will be basically rectangular modules with, like tiny little railroad cars. And they'll come in different lengths, and you can have them with different equipment levels. And most people won't bother to own one, but you can own one if you want, you know, and have it. And, and it can it can have a, a Bentley badge, but other than a badge in the front, there's not going to be anything different about it. Uh, and then when you want to use it, you'll have to enter it into the system when you fire it up. And it, whether it's your car or not, it will be part of the autonomous system, and you won't be able to go any faster or slower than that system wants the car to go. And it'll be integrated into the flow of similar modules on the freeway. And then as you approach your exit, it'll automatically separate from the flow. The gap will gradually close. Then it'll go into deceleration lanes. Uh, it'll get scanned when it goes out the freeway exit, take it to your final destination, uh, swipe the credit card, send it away, and it's ready for the next customer. No must, no fuss, no bother. And there, there will be a tipping point when, which is maybe 20 years from now, when the safety organs of each country figure out that 100% of the accidents are being caused by the remaining human-driven cars. <laughs> and then, then, then the legislation is going to say, OK, guys, that's it. No more human-driven cars on the highway. You're free to keep them, but they've got to be on private property. But the blend of human-driven and autonomous simply does not work. Thank you very much. And so the same fate as the horse. You don't see, you don't see horse-drawn carriages on freeways. Not on what's freeways. The, what's the fate of car companies then? You know, that's an interesting question. Um, can you name me a company, a major company that makes subway cars, a major company that makes... Railway cars, 
uh, brands become irrelevant at that point when I, I, I kind of refuse to believe that that we will give up personal ownership completely and to me if you are going to own a, per, a car a car personally yeah. and it's only going to be driven around by you and rich people aren't going to want to get in where someone else has been sitting and farting and whatever else they're going to want their own car and i think that car is going to want style and design it's going to say who they are but the, and there will be little companies that make those maybe yeah but <laughs> The, the, the freedom for the designer will be very restricted because a lot of the topography of this thing is going to have is going to be mandated. I have to imagine you, you'll have a maximum width and you'll pay by the length. And if you want a long car with a what used to be a hood with an engine under it just because it looks good, you pay for that space uh, that you're wasting. But you'll mess up the aerodynamics of when they're all linked. If you have, mm -hmm. you know, everybody has a high roof with minimum separation, and then suddenly a couple of guys have an E-type Jaguar configured autonomous car, and then it goes up again, it's going to mess up that whole train. I, you know, I don't know. It's just that, um, and as I always, as I always say, my my views on autonomous cars are a careful blend of fact and personal opinion. Um, and I, I let the audience sort it out. But it's, it's, it's perfectly possible that uh, to placate the public, the authorities will say, well, okay, we'll give up a little efficiency and we'll still allow for individual designs and you can still have a low coupe-shaped autonomous car, which will go no faster than anybody else's autonomous, or you can still have a convertible. That's possible. If, if I were designing the system, I wouldn't do that. I'd, I'd take that away and have people own them in off-road parks. And imagine all the fun in off-road areas where people can still drive four-wheel drive vehicles with abandon. And I, I think the creativity and the joy of individual ownership will come with the cars that you own outside of your basic transportation vehicle. A better question is what happens to the car magazines. <laughs> <laughs> that that's a good Seriously, one. This year at Car of the Year, a lot of the you know table chat at dinners and so forth was the existential threat to our way of living here and our well, it jobs. Is. It yeah. is. Car guys, with, when the dawn of the autonomous era, car guys are basically out of business. Well, you know, I'm sure a hundred years ago, of the course, same argument. You can come and lay a little message on my grave, you know, when it happens. I'll see if I get it. Yeah, no, 100 years ago, I'm sure that was the same thing. What, what, what's going to happen to all these people who know how to drive a team of horses? Or, you know, or if they're in these horseless horse carriages. Or who know how to make wooden spokes. Or, that, that's yeah. right. Yeah. Hey, we've, we've got a phone call here that the, the, the crew is itching for me to, to, to bring in. Let's bring in that phone call from Youngblood right now. Hey, guys, this is Youngblood from Cleveland, Ohio. Uh, my comment is to Mr. Lutz. Mr. Lutz, whether you know it or not, I'm writing you in as uh, my write-in candidate for President of the United States. With your discipline and background, I know you'd uh, kick ass and take names later and get something done. That's what I'm after. That's about it. Uh, who uh, Semper Fi, brother. Okay, Semper Fi to you God, too, but, help us. Later. but I'll... Bye. I'll tell you, young blood, don't waste your don't waste your vote because I'm Swiss born, <laughs> so I'm ineligible. But thank you anyway. Well, there you go, Bob Lutz for president. We should have the bumper sticker on your car. Well, as I say, it'd, it'd be we'll uh, just change uh, the constitution. Be a, be a, well, okay, if you can handle that, I can. <laughs> I, I'm willing to serve. Hey, we got to take another quick break right now, Carmen. Let's give a shout out to our friends at Lear. Lear Connexus offers a parental controls application with geofencing that sends notifications regarding driving behavior and location, including curfew alerts, acceleration alerts, and speed alerts, all delivered to a smartphone application that includes vehicle location, driver notifications, and a report card of driving history, including notifications when predefined geographic boundaries are crossed. For more information, visit Lear.com. That's pretty deep. Okay, yeah, all this electronic stuff coming in. Some yeah. of it's good. 
So, yeah, very interesting. How fast do you think autonomy is going to hit? I think it's going to be a gradual uh, process going from stage one through stage four, and I expect that stage four will be with us in 20, 20 to 25 years. And a lot of it depends on, you know, overall economic prosperity. If, if we have some sort of economic cataclysm and state and federal governments around the world run out of money, then there's not going to be any money to, to provide the infrastructure that the, the autonomous vehicles are going to need. Because you can't unleash trains of autonomous vehicles on the highways the way they are today. There would be a lot of reconfiguration if you want them electric. And I think the uh, autonomous vehicles provide a very good opportunity for electric vehicles. Uh, you're going to need to put inductive cables in the freeways to charge the batteries as they go, or at least maintain the charge as they go at high speed. <clears throat> I, I think some of the where it will be adopted first is I, I think we will very quickly come to the point where certain fixed route vehicles like grocery delivery vehicles, uh, garbage pickup and stuff like that, known routes with frequent start stops and easy to signal stops uh, will be the first to go fully autonomous. Because really, And then the next step will be Services like Uber, who operate in a known environment um, and have a, a predictable frequency of using certain routes, et cetera, et cetera, be, it'll be relatively easy to replace the Uber drivers. To me, the Uber model is the model of the future autonomous car, but it still has a driver, and the, and the driver will be superfluous in another few years. So, so closer time, speaking of Uber, what, is, what does Uber do to car ownership? Do you see that having a big effect on whether individuals... No, I, I think cars? the primary impact at this point is on taxi fleets. I mean, it's the world's biggest and most effective taxi fleet and doesn't look like you're in a taxi. Mm -hmm. So I think the first, the first victims will be taxi, but there's no question that car sharing services... Um, can have an impact on car ownership because, say, you, you pay for a service which, depending on your weekend needs, you can either take a Tahoe or take a Camaro convertible or take a Corvette coupe or whatever happens to suit your needs at that particular time. You just call up and say, um, I'm a member of this group that has access to, you know, and, probably goes by points, you know, the more, more expensive vehicle, they deduct more points. But I, I could see that that would have a, a potential effect on car ownership. Uh, but the, the car companies are embracing it. Why? Because if they don't, their competitors will. So you're, you're forced to go along with it, even, if you, even though you see that there's an inherent risk in their long term. You have to go along with it. But again, it's, it's, to me, it's all... I'm, I'm glad to see uh, General Motors and Ford embracing all this new technology and these new ways to use vehicles and these new ways to uh, conquer the problem of efficient surface transportation, even though they know that they may be potentially contributing to their own demise. Better they attack themselves, though. Well, that's exactly right. I mean, it's they're in a it's 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 the old um, decision point where, which as we all I learned in military aviation, when you're picking between certain death and probable death, always pick probable. <laughs> right. <laughs> Hey, getting back to autonomy a little bit, we, Ed Niederbeyer tweeted in, would love to hear your thoughts on Tesla's autopilot. Well, I don't feel qualified to comment on Tesla's autopilot except to um, say that I, I don't think anybody's autopilot at this stage is mature enough for prime time. And despite the Tesla announcement the other day that effective immediately all Teslas will be uh, delivered with um, 
fully automatic or fully automated driving uh, hardened software, but in fact, they were, I think they modified that to say, we're delivering all cars to where that can later be uploaded when it's finally available. So I don't think a hell of a lot has changed, but it was a, it was a good announcement. Uh, frankly, I mean, I'm, I'm a well-known Tesla skeptic, and I, uh, and especially after the do documented failures of uh, their so-called autopilot, which they no longer call autopilot, I don't think. Uh, I, I tend to view all Tesla promises and pronouncements with a, a dose of skepticism. Well, well, that ties into his follow-up question. What do you think of their less than one year development timeline for the Model 3? It's, uh, I stand by my, my original <laughs> prediction. Ain't gonna happen. Yeah. And, um, and again, here, Tesla does not have a good track record of fulfilling their own promises. And uh, my guess is the Model S will be with us. Yeah, they'll have some sort of, just like he did with the Model X, you know, about a year before the Model X actually hit production, they built four or five by hand, had four or five happy customers came come in, put them in the cars, get all the TV and said, we're in production. Well, no, they weren't. What they did was they delivered four pre-production hand-built cars. Uh, and they'll probably do the same with the Model S and, and have a big TV thing some pl sometime in the middle of next year and have 20 or 30 Model S's and, or Model, Model 3s, three, sorry. I say, there we are. The, the first customers are happily driving away in their, in their Model 3s. But the real production, and I, I stick by this, will be sometime in 2018. Yeah, not the end of next year. No. So that the, the Bolt will have, Chevy Bolt will have at least a one year to one and a half year lead on them. And you've driven the Bolt? Yes. It's a fascinating car. Um, I'm not totally enamored of the looks, you know. I wish it either was more of a crossover or more of a sedan. It's kind of in the middle. But it's no question that it's roomy, it's ergonomically wonderful. It goes like hell. I mean, it's, it's a wonderful car to drive. And uh, I love the steering, everything, everything of, dynamically, you could not imagine a nicer car. And I love the one pedal driving where depending on how far off you lift your foot. Remind, I, you know, I've done this before in my life someplace. I can't remember that. Dodgems when I was a kid. Remember you lifted your, your foot off of that metal mushroom and the things <laughs> slowed down right away. Frank, you've driven the, the yeah, Chevy Yeah, quite Bolt like TV it. Too. Yep. it. It's as world-class a B-segment car as the Tesla was, you know, a D-segment sedan yeah. in my view. Yeah. So. It's really nice. So the packaging is great. Five people sit upright in it comfortably. Six footers can sit behind themselves. Yeah. Well, it's really a tall sedan rather than a rather than a crossover. But the package works well. And, the, and, and with a low center of gravity, and there's no tippy feel to it. And, and it's, it's like I've, I've experienced this before with other cars. You object. To, you're sort of uncertain about the appearance until after you've driven the car and then all of a sudden it looks a hell of a lot better. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Okay, so a question for you guys. Uh, could the Bolt EV be a tipping point where people start to look at Chevrolet or General Motors in a good way? And I, one of the reasons I ask this is, as you guys may be aware, Steve Wozniak, you know, one of the co-founders of Apple, they got him in one of them. He said, I'm getting rid of my Tesla. This is the car I want right now. The asterisk that goes with that, and we've just got a, a couple pieces up online right now uh, this week, is that with a Tesla with 230 miles and a supercharger network, you start to say, I can go to San Francisco from L.A. I, mean, I could go across country. That's a little trickier. you got to pick a certain route. But you could go a little further than the one, uh, one tank of electrons will get you. And with the Bolt, with that 50 uh, amp charger, not really the same. You know, now you drive into a, a supercharger, 
There's no getting fumbling with your wallet. There's no punching any. You just come near the car. Just the nearness of the supercharger thing opens the thing. Plug in. You have 20 minutes in the Starbucks, and you're ready to go with 80% charge or whatever. With the Bolt, you know, with that 50, if, if you got to find one of these first of all. It's charge points, and you got to get out a thing, and you're swiping, and it's, it, there. A lot of times they have two. Uh, you know, units, a Chatamo and a regular one, and only one can be used. So if there's a leaf there charging up with the high, you gotta wait till he's done 30 to 40 minutes before you can, so it's, you're not gonna have that let's go on a long trip and just charge up along the way thing to the same extent. But that said, I mean, aren't we getting to the point, I mean, when you were describing the autonomous cars, Bob, I mean, you, you get the sense that cars are going to be changing, that, you know, they're not going to be the proverbial Swiss army knife, do yeah. everything sort of thing. And so maybe if you have this long trip, you're going to say, I'm leaving the Bolt at home, sure. and I'm going to use one of these car sharing exactly. services. But and, the difference is we got else. the car that could be your only car, and then you got this, I still got to have a, a trip car. Even though the, the range anxiety is almost nil with 238 or 48 if you put and it in actually, L mode. I think most of the media were getting close to 300. If you use it in the L mode, you get quite a bit further than uh, in the D mode. Yeah. Or Look, the D I, mode, whatever yeah. they call it, the regenerative braking mode. Right. Yeah, no, I, I'm knocked out by the bolt. I, I think it's fantastic. Me too. I, I think it's going to surprise a lot of people. Your, your point, though, Frank, is really good. General Motors doesn't have a fast charging net. No, and I mean, it's coming and it's going to roll out as the batteries change. They're, they're talking about 80 and It'll 100. Come. It'll come. Yeah. In the meantime, you know, I doubt that people will be taking a, a Chevy Bolt to the West Coast. No, on the other hand, yeah, it's not a big enough car to really want to take big long trips in. Like we were talking about earlier, you know, that's the beautiful thing of this plug in. Pacifica minivan. That's a great long distance hauler and it's a great carpooler in towns. So if you do all your carpooling on electrons and all your tripping uh, on I'll, I'll where, the, where the bolt is just going to be ideal for people who have a 50 mile commute to work. Mm -hmm. They can, um, and actually the Volt was nice for people who had a 40 ish mile commute to work if they had a, a plug in a, a opportunity at work. They, so like my son in law, used to have a Range Rover, now he's got a Chevy Volt and a 40 mile commute. And he's gone from a $400 a month gasoline bill down to zero. As a, but with the Chevy Bolt, you could do your 50 mile commute to work, your 50 mile commute home, no intermediate charging, and when you get home, plug it in. Next morning, you've got another 240 miles in the tank. So right. basically for uh, medium distance urban and suburban use you're ne you're always starting up from home with a full tank and that's um, that's one of the joys of electric vehicles that people never think about on the gasoline powered vehicle unless you stop at the pump every day uh, your you know your your gauge reads less and less at the beginning of the day than the day before the electric vehicle if you remember to plug it in every morning is a full tank. And we're getting real close to inductive chargers. You just pull over and you don't even have to yeah, plug in. Yeah, exactly. Plug in. Yeah, which, is, which will be nice. Hey, look, uh, w w we've burned up most of the hour for the show. Really? We've got a ton of questions well, here. How, how, about do, how about we do uh, a rapid fire I'll run try, through? I'll, I'll try to add short answers, which okay. I'm not good at. Okay, Jonathan Brown wants to know, what's the price of the Destino? 229000 Okay, Bob says, as one cigar fan to another, do you have some recommendations that yes. are currently on your go-to selection? Oliva, Series O and Series V, made in Nicaragua. I just happen to have one here today. This is an Oliva Series V Bellicoso. It's one of the finest cigars ever. Duly noted. Kevin Fetty wants to know, what chassis changes were required due to the weight loss of the battery? Uh, the first one we did, we used the original Fisker Springs, and uh, we had about a six-inch gap over <laughs> between the tires <laughs> and the wheel well. So we basically kept... Uh, the spring characteristics, but we shortened them, and, um, and we got it down to this ride height. We have the same suspension travel that Fisker did, and we have basically the same shock absorber tuning. Okay, guest 549 wants to know, are there other major components sourced from the VET? Uh, yeah, it, it, actually the original Fisker Karma had many of its components sourced from the Corvette, like uh, steering, steering rack, and so forth. 
as, as far as I'm, I, I think front steering arms, um, uh, uh, and a lot of interior components, door solenoids. So it's a good question. It really is mechanically mostly a GM car. Rafi from Baton Rouge wants to know, what do you think of the new Lincoln Continental? Is it half-hearted effort compared to Cadillac? Uh, that's interesting. I haven't made up my mind. I was totally in love with the concept car. Mm -hmm. I'm a little bit less in love with the production version, and frankly, I wouldn't have, I wouldn't have, if I would, you know. Uh, I know what you're going to say here, I bet. It's, it's the droopy front end, you know, that that grill with the, the curve oh, we got a picture top, of it up and here. then, yeah, look at that, that's, it's sagged, it's like a loaf of bread that was taken out of the oven too soon, the whole thing just <laughs> sags a little bit. And it's just the orientation of that grill and the shape is just wrong. It needs to be rotated to the to more vertically and those corners, the top corners need to come up a little bit. I mean, it's just bad. However, I understand the car is good. It looks enough like a Bentley that it will trigger Bentley feelings in people and it will, my guess is, as far as sedans go, that's the qualifier. As far as sedans go, it will be commercially successful. Buzzed wants to know, how much longer do you think GM can stick with push rods? Oh, God, forever. <laughs> uh, I mean, nothing wrong with them. You can, you can rev them 7,000 RPM. It's the most compact engine in the world. It's easy to do valve disabling, whereas uh, with dual overhead cams on, on a V8, by the time you've got the valve disabler sitting on top of the camshafts, you, you need a hood about six foot high. Uh, uh, look, at a Corvette has a combination of performance and fuel economy unequaled by any other major sports car in the world, thanks to the pushrod engine. Lightweight, compact, and, you know, back in the old days, you say, yeah, well, pushrod engines are fine up to about 4,500 RPM or 5,000. No, they'll rev six, five to seven all day long with no problem. So um, the Germans may sneer at the, um, the backward Americans with their silly pushrod engines, but uh, they have a hard time beating a Z06. Especially at Le Mans. Royal with cheese wants to know, are you going to make new cars eventually? Uh, well, I, I would say this is a new car, but yes, we have several in the mill. Okay, John in Atlanta says, who was your favorite boss and least favorite one to work for? Well, you know, go pick up my book, Icons and Idiots, and it will <laughs> all be revealed there. He also wants to know, any, any auto executive out there today that you'd like to work with? Uh, you know, I don't know him well enough, to be honest. Okay, Guest 720 says, did you ever consider an LS7 engine? Better mileage, he says. Yeah, and we we probably would, um, and or or we could actually go to the uh, new Z06 engine, uh, which is an all new small block, and as a crate motor, it's less expensive than the ZR1 engine. But you know, we have to watch our engineering bill, and any engine change, you're starting over with emissions compliance and with OBD2 and all of the electronics, and then getting the engine to talk to the transmission and to talk to the body computer and talk to the stability control system. It's another two-year project. So as, as for the foreseeable future, even if uh, the same thing goes actually for the new eight-speed transmission, you know, we'd like to use that. And if we were doing a one-off, of course, we'd immediately get the new eight-speed, but the eight-speed transmission has a different electronic program from the six-speed and this is the engineered solution that we have right now. And, and frankly, this is what we're going to be selling for a while. He'd also like to have you comment on GM's record profits and the fact that they're focusing less on market share. Yeah, well, and, and despite that, the market share has recently gone up. And it just goes to show that if you de-emphasize volume at all costs and get off of the excessive incentives and... Take the pain for a while, but sell your cars for what they're actually worth and put value in the cars. That is the strategy that GM has pursued. I mean, any automotive tester today will, will and correct me if I'm wrong, but you drive a new Malibu 
And you say, this thing feels like $25,000 more. And the interior looks like $25,000 It's a beautiful more. car. It's fantastic. It doesn't get any better. I don't care whose brand you buy. And the public is gradually, gradually, little by little, waking up to the fact that GM cars are really outstandingly good now. And they look good. Uh, their, their value retention or their depreciation rate with the residual values are up. Um, uh, so uh, right now, Mary Barra and the team are just doing everything right. George from Sunnyvale wants to know, can you confirm that the Corvette C7 was originally supposed to be a mid-engine car? Yeah, sure. And I was part of that. And we had it all ready to go. We had a full-size fiberglass model. <coughs> And we had a full-size fiberglass model of a Cadillac XLR successor, which was also mid-engine. And then the 08 downturn hit, and that was all canceled. And what was what was then a $900 million program became, here's $200 million, do the best you can with it. <laughs> Frank Fanny. But the car turned out great, so. No, it did. Uh, Fra you know, Le Mans victories and all. Frank Fanny says, whatever happened to transonic combustion and the supercritical fuel injection? Well, it was a great idea, but it took a long time to develop the injectors uh, with the little heating coil around them. <clears throat> were very difficult to make and very delicate. And at the end of the day, you know, other, other emissions technologies, such as hybrid systems, became cheaper and cheaper, and the transonic system... Uh, especially with increasing emission regulations, was getting more and more expensive. And finally, the original venture cap investors, after having financed several additional rounds, said, you know what, we're used to Silicon Valley. We're, you have an idea, we finance it, we have the IPO in six months, and we're out of here with a bunch of cash. <laughs> We've been hanging around this thing for four years now. And we don't like that. So it, it unfortunately got shut down. But you're right. The, the superheated plasma injection uh, still in, in your mind makes a lot of sense, which is... Smokey well, Eunuch worked on it. You, hmm? Smokey Eunuch had the idea yeah, for yeah. plasma injection decades ago. I, I, just, I didn't know that. <laughs> yeah. uh, so did uh, Carol Shelby. Okay, back to the rapid fire. M360 wants to know, why does GM seem to take a back seat when it comes to leadership in trucks? Ford leapfrogged it with the aluminum F-150 and transit vans. Why did they let Ford get so far ahead of them? Well, I don't think they are ahead. I don't think they are ahead because GM is basically still on maximum overtime of its steel trucks, and the aluminum 150 is taking two weeks downtime as we speak to balance inventories. And weirdly enough, um, and I don't have enough data to state this for a fact, but it looks to me like the new aluminum F-150 is not as successful as Ford hoped. Um, I think they've got them on transit, though. Uh, I say the point is legitimate on the transit. And it's interesting that... It's exactly the same in Europe. I mean, Ford has had the transit line forever. And General Motors just can't get on the step with medium commercial vans. So I, I and it's one of the questions yeah. that I keep having for GM when I get invited to retired officers. I say, what, what's our plan for medium commercial vans? Well, you'll see, we're coming up with something, but hey, Nobody can be perfect in all areas, and uh, you could also argue that if you want to, if you want to see who's leapfrogging whom, look at the look at the Chevy Colorado and GMC Canyon, uh, last year's Point. truck of the year, uh, selling extremely well, have added to General Motors' overall market share, did not displace any of the full size, and is the only semi-compact truck in America with a diesel engine. So. Yeah. Okay, last question in rapid fire here. David Hughes says, I think I heard you say that Lincoln will not survive. Can you give us some details on why you Yeah, that, that? I expressed that, in, I expressed that opinion in uh, Road and Track, I think, in my column. And, and, and uh, what I said is, I don't think there's enough time left for the automobile industry as we know it to transform the Lincoln brand and make it truly aspirational again. Because... Lincoln has just now started 
focusing a great effort on actually doing vehicles that are different from their Ford counterparts, look different, feel different, and hopefully are mechanically different, although I don't think we're quite there yet. Uh, Cadillac has been pouring money at rehabilitating the brand for the last 15 years with a unique Cadillac architecture, rear wheel drive, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And frankly, it has yet to pay off fully for Cadillac. Cadillac still is not a top tier luxury brand. It's not with Mercedes, BMW, Audi, and Lexus. It's unfortunately more down with Infiniti and Acura. And, and right now, Lincoln isn't even in the Cadillac, Infiniti, and Acura League. And uh, in, the, in, in terms of changing a product image, it's taken BMW, Mercedes, and Audi 30, 30 to 40 years of consistent delivery, consistent design, consistent engineering, and consistent brand marketing to achieve the position that they've got. To get back up there in the 20 years that the automobile industry as we know it has left, I don't think there's enough time to make that transformation anymore. So will it go away? No. Um, I think that it'll, it'll have a, a very successful little life um, doing nice crossovers. But I, if you ask me, are we going to see the time when a guy says, so what would you wind up buying? You know, his buddies all look at him and he says, I bought a Lincoln. And they say, wow, holy mackerel. Jesus, what's it like? And unfortunately, Cadillac isn't there either, but at least with Cadillac, they no longer sneer. And, <laughs> and, and they say, oh, really? What, did you get a CTSV? You know, mm -hmm. might be the next question. Um, but I'm afraid with Lincoln, it's still Lincoln. Why'd you do that? Yeah. You know, but they, they got a heck of a deal. It's, yeah, that's exactly right. It's price deal. And it, I'll tell you, it's a long road back. And, and I used to say, oh, no, no, we can change. I was right with Buick. Everybody wanted to dump Buick. And I said, nope, we can save Buick. All we have to do is do really good cars and crossovers. And today, Buick is back. You know, they've become a legitimate brand again. But that was like 10 to 12 years of effort. I've never seen it done that fast. And right now, arguably, I would say right now, arguably, the Buick brand standing is above Lincoln's. I don't know. Mm. I think if Lincoln, you know, tries real hard, they can come up and slightly surpass Buick, but they're going to be below Cadillac for a long time, uh, and they're they're going to be in the They've uh, Acura. Their they're going to be times. in the they gave, Acura. Let's give them an idea, and we'll go with them. Oh wait, no, that's uh, oh, it's, that's, it's a new that's front end. Different, yeah. It's a new front end every year. Yeah. In the luxury, that's BMW consistency, kidneys. Audi, the open grill with the rings. Uh, Mercedes, it's always the same grill theme with the, with the big star. And Lincoln, for the last 10 or 15 years, and all over the place. It's like every, every time there's a new guy in the Lincoln studio, he says, we're going to do a new front end. And, yeah, and, and when the yeah. LS came out, we all said, yeah. hey, Lincoln's really going places here. And that's about the time CTS, whatever, you know. Yeah. But they never took their foot off the gas at Cadillac. And Lincoln's all oh, railroad drive, too expensive. we got to do something else. Uh. So does the corporation continue to fund Lincoln? Yeah, I think as long as it's a profitable brand and as long as the cost is more or less the same as a Ford plus another $500 for a better interior and more electronic features, and the margin is two thousand dollars better than a Ford. Uh, you're, even if even if the Lincoln brand doesn't reattain re true luxury status and respect, it can be a money maker. Like Buick is a money maker. GMC is a phenomenal money maker. Phenomenal. I mean, it's a, it's. A In fact, we were talking here the other day. The Denali brand generates more revenue in America than the Land Rover brand completely. Not only that, the highest transaction prices of any brand in the United States today, I mean, excluding Lincoln and, you know, the low volume, excluding Bentley and the low volume guys, but GMC has the highest transaction prices of any mass market brand. Higher than Mercedes, higher than BMW. That's extraordinary. <laughs>
<laughs> Good luck having here. Yeah. Well, that's because yeah. GMC doesn't have any three series or C classes or A classes. Yeah. Yeah. It's all it's all at the medium to top end, and Denali is now accounting for something like thirty percent of GMC that's sales. Unreal. That's incredible. Yeah. Hey, look. I was about to say we could go on another hour. I think yeah. we could go on another couple of days. <laughs> but we do got to wrap this up at some point, and we probably should do it now. But okay. Bob Lutz, so much uh, thanks for coming on the show. Always it's, fun. Thank you very yeah. much. Frank Marcus, thanks for stopping by. Good thanks to have you here. Thanks for the invitation, here. as always. And Gary, we ought to keep doing this, too. We should. Let, yeah. Let's do another show next week. All right. Okay. Right. Good deal. I want to thank all of you for having tuned in. Auto Line After Hours is brought to you by Bridgestone Tires, your journey, our passion. And by Lear, a global leader in automotive seating and electrical systems. Visit our website, Autoline.tv, where you can watch us live Thursday afternoons. Get your daily fix with Autoline Daily and in-depth analysis and interviews with Autoline This Week. There's all that and much more at Autoline.tv.